Hello, welcome to another Tweedy Pubs video. Sorry about the traffic noise. I'm here in the area of Smithfield today. the Viaduct Tavern. This is probably a terrible place to do the pub blurb because it's a busy junction, there's a lot of traffic passing by. But, um, the name obviously reflects the nearby Hoban Viaduct which was built in the 1860s and crosses what is effectively the valley of the River Fleet, although I think by that point of history the River Fleet had already been culverted through that stretch. Uh, but it did mean that traffic could cross more easily from the city of London in towards the West End without having to go down one side of a hill and up another side of a hill, kept a sort of level playing field, so to speak. The interior of the pub has what I suppose you could call a triptych. There's a series of three glazed, possibly enamel paintings on the wall, and they represent the, somehow the three paintings represent the four themes, not quite sure how that uh, works out of commerce, industry, art, and agriculture. And those four themes are also represented in four statues on Hoban Viaduct. It's an 1870s pub originally with a later rebuild in the 1890s and it's notable for a lot of its etched glass, uh, uh, what would probably lazily be called a gin palace in style. And also particularly of note has a glazed in office at the back. The cellars here are apparently of some note as well having originally been used as uh, the jail cells for a debtor's prison on this site and are purportedly haunted. Today it's operated by Fuller's, fairly standard Fuller's beer lineup on the bar. Um, I forget how much, uh, I had a half of London Pride, forget how much that cost. We're gonna head on more into Smithfield from here. Clerkenwell, the area into which Smithfield juts to the north, is an area that has a long monastic history. And behind me here is the gatehouse to St. Bartholomew the Great, originally an Augustinian priory, founded in 1123. Of course the church no doubt has some architectural merit of its own, but it's really the, uh, the gatehouse that I find most eye-catching. It was built in 1595 and has this wonderful Tudor frontage that we see today that was hidden for a lot of its history. Uh, those uh, renovations were completed in 1932. Really is a miraculous survival. There are very few pre-Great Fire of London timber frame buildings left in London. This is one of just a handful. And uh, part of the reason that it survived was the fact that it was protected by the priory walls of St. Bartholomew the Great. Quick walk through the churchyard at St. Bartholomew the Great and we come to our next pub, the Rising Sun on Cloth Fair. Cheers from the Rising Sun. It is a Sam Smith's pub today, so I'm having some of their old brewery bitter, if I can remember how much it was. Was it £2.45 for a half? But put that up on the screen. Definitely get a sense of a Victorian pub interior uh, at the moment, and that's, you know, classically what Sam Smith's pubs always tend to, to go for in their sort of restorations. Uh, but there may have been a pub on this site going back to at least 1616, and it may have been called the Star in a former incarnation. It is believed that body snatchers or grave diggers, it's a pretty gruesome area all told Smithfield, used to meet in the upstairs room of this pub and discuss where to uh, had to go to get the latest supply and that was partly to fuel a, a demand for them for um, anatomy lessons at nearby St Bart's Hospital. This would have at one time been the regular haunt of Sir John Betjeman, one time poet laureate. One of my favourite anecdotes about John Betjeman actually comes to us from the slightly surprising route of uh, Barry Humphreys. He of Dame Edna Everidge fame. Barry Humphreys freshly arrived from Australia. Uh, John described himself not as a poet but as a senior journalist and in his book cluttered sitting room lined with green William Morris wallpaper he dispensed generous late morning drinks usually bubbly i.e. champagne in pewter tankards to friends such as Osbert Lancaster, Philip Larkin, Kingsley Amis and not seldom an Anglican priest or two. 
after a few drinks and in an exalted mood, we would all repair to Coleman's Chop House in Aldersgate Street, where the atmosphere and the appointments were immutably pre-war. You can actually stay in John Betjeman's former home. It's now owned by the Landmark Trust. It occupies, I believe, the first and second floors, a sort of upper maisonette of 43 cloth fare. And uh, as, as, as far as I can tell, it still has that William Morris wallpaper that Barry Humphreys, Barry Humphreys alluded to. Cheers from the hand and cheers. The charm is all very much downstairs. Um, but I'm slightly competing there with uh, Phil Collins, easy lover. So <laughs> you may well appreciate not having that as a backdrop. To a bit of pub blurb. Current building dates to 1832, but there may well have been a pub on this site all the way back to 1532. The fortunes of this pub are, as the name might suggest, intricately linked with the Bartholomew Fair. And you may have noticed the local street names, Cloth Fair, and uh, this area was, in addition to the, uh, the, the produce, the, the meat markets that we see at Smithfield, there was also here Bartholomew Fair a few days a year, a cloth fair. The Hand and Shears, of course, is a reference to that, but specifically one of the traditions of opening the Bartholomew Fair was that the Mayor of London would come and cut the first piece of cloth. You may have seen, uh, as a worldwide tradition now, the, uh, the act of uh, a notable local celebrity or a mayor or somebody else of importance cutting a ribbon to open anything from a shopping centre to a school to an airport. And it's believed that that tra tradition actually dates back to the, the cloth fair, Bartholomew fair um, here and is remembered in this name, Hand and Shears. Plain and rather unremarkable as the upstairs function room at the Hand and Shears is today. This was at one time the meeting place for the Court of Pie Powders, a very strangely named organisational committee who were responsible for effectively running Bartholomew Fair, the cloth fair, and setting out sort of weights and measures and managing disputes. As with many of these Victorian pub interiors we've seen before, it has an island servery which would have at one time served multiple separate bar areas. And you can still see some evidence of that in the, the entrance doorways there. Uh, there's at least one marked public bar and there was a separate saloon bar and private bar in those spaces. One of the other claims to fame, more grisly Smithfield history, this was apparently one of the last ports of call for condemned men on their way to Newgate Prison. And uh, this was one of the places where they would be able to have one final drink. And the landlord would kindly say, would you like another one? And the prisoner would reply, no, I'm on the wagon. And the phrase purportedly, I'm on the wagon, meaning that you're abstaining from alcohol, uh, came from that tradition. Whether or not that was specifically this pub or another pub, impossible to prove. There we go, the Hand and Cheers there, a perennially popular pub. Not exactly a long walk, to the next pub on today's itinerary, the Old Red Cow. Cheers from the Old Red Cow. There's um, a board behind me describing some of the pub's history. It's it very modernised uh, on the inside today. Uh, you know, doesn't really feel very so old and pubby, but I think there is some interesting history to the Old Red Cow. The, the name is an interesting one. It wasn't in the dictionary of pub names. One theory I read was the fact that the a, a red cow is such a rare thing suggests that it's, uh, it's produce, it's milk, it's something that is greatly sought after um, and, and therefore uh, as a bizarre me metaphor indicates that the, uh, the, the beer here will be of particular interest. Um, and it's current art incarnation. <laughs> I'd say that's the case for my, my particular taste. Very sort of, you know, keg-based craft beer on the bar. The pub was rebuilt in 1854. I'm sort of slightly fascinated by pubs that have old in the name. At what point did they become old? You know, they can't have been called old from the moment they were first established. And it seems that this is often something that happens around a rebuild, that the, um, the, the owners of the newly rebuilt pub 
want to remind everybody that you know this is a, a venerable establishment even though it may look a bit sort of um, you know new and shiny right now so it does seem to be around the 1850s that, that rebuild that the, uh, the pub was renamed the name was embellished with the word old I suspect in this particular setting the name Red Cow may have some relation to Smithfield Market with the uh, you know being a, a meat market and at one time having an abattoir on site and it probably has some bearing on sort of you know bloodied animals going for slaughter or something grisly like that everything around Smithfield is a bit grisly I feel like we ought to briefly cover the, the modern incarnation of Smithfield Market I believe there were originally five buildings or sections of Smithfield Market and only two of them are today in use with the other three in a sort of slight state of disrepair with slightly uncertain futures I, I've lost track of what's going on with them but the um the Smithfield Market as people know it today is this meat market and uh, built in the 1860s by Sir Horace Jones who also built Leadenhall and Billingsgate Market so that's why you may find this style slightly familiar from um, other London markets. Behind me was the entrance to the at one time Cock Tavern which was uh, a basement pub within Smithfield Market. Sadly closed in 2013. I never went uh, so I never got to enjoy the bizarre charm of a pub that almost exclusively opened in the morning. It served full English breakfast and pints of Guinness as I understand it. But alas no more Next up we have the Fox and Anchor, sorry about the lighting, shooting into the sun a little bit here, cheers. This dates to the, the current incarnation of this pub, dates to the 1890s and is built in uh, what was at the time called the modern style, which doesn't really give you a lot of clues, uh, it's not a name that has aged well, sometimes referred to probably retrospectively as British Art Nouveau. Uh, an interesting thing about Art Nouveau is the name sounds intrinsically French, but it had a lot of its roots in England, in, uh, in the arts and crafts movement, so you know, once again in this video William Morris is sticking his immaculately hand-carved or into the proceedings. The ceramic parts of the frontage were manufactured by Royal Dalton and designed by W.J. Neatby, who is perhaps best known for his work on the tiling in Harrods Food Hall. The name is a bit of an enigma, the Fox and Anchor. There are many pubs around the country where the fox uh, in a pub name is paired with some other object or some other animal. Apparently one possible cause of this, according to the Dictionary of Pub Names, which is well worth a read if you're curious about where pub names come from, is that uh, a simple act of when a publican moved from one pub to another, they often brought the name of their previous pub to the new pub. So it could be that at some point in history, this was just called the Fox or just called the Anchor, and a publican who had previously worked at a Fox and or Anchor moved here, and thus we had this sort of strange marriage of seemingly incongruous pub signage artifacts. The upper parts of the frontage, the exterior, are particularly noteworthy, and to read from Historic England's listing, shaped gable of eccentric almost circular profile filled with ornament in coloured faience of a fox and anchor flanking a stylized tree. Apparently a Green King pub today although I didn't find that immediately obvious from the lineup on the bar. I'm drinking um, Sambrook's Junction uh, which is pleasant possibly one of the more expensive pubs so far on today's itinerary I think that was three pounds 15 for a half something like that so it's going to be definitely north of six for a pint the Fox and Anchor there is on Charterhouse Street which leads on to Charterhouse Square and Charterhouse was uh, a uh, derives from a priory of 1371 the name is a corruption of Carthusian. Charter House had various uses throughout the centuries. It became a school at one point and uh, there were a series of arms houses. We can possibly see some remnant of those behind us there. And, uh, and then latterly the land that was once occupied by that Carthusian priory became a uh, medical school, one of the most recognisable buildings around Charterhouse Square, to, particularly to people of a certain age, is Florin Court, which you may know as Whitehaven Mansions. It was the setting for Hercule Poirot's home in the 1980s TV adaptation of Agatha Christie's novel starring David Suchet. 
to the north of Spitalfield, Spit <laughs> to the north of Smithfield, we come to this wonderful edifice, St John's Gate. This was built in 1504 as an entrance to the inner precinct of Clerkenwell Priory and is further evidence of the area's monastic history. This was the home of the Knights Hospitaller. Hospitaller? Hospitaller? I'm never quite sure how to pronounce that. It's an organisation that uh, was associated with the Crusades in ancient history, but uh, eventually in a somewhat circuitous route, grew into what is now the St John's Ambulance Brigade, with a bit of a sort of gap in the middle caused by Henry VIII, as always. So that brings us to the final pub of today's tour, the Holy Tavern. I knew this as the Jerusalem Tavern, but it had a sort of rebrand in around 2022, just a, a year or so ago. This, um, it may be hard to believe from looking at the interior, but this has only been a pub since 1996. And uh, I believe it was developed by the St. Peter's Brewery, who despite the change of ownership are still su supplying the beers here. They were trying to sort of recreate a Georgian style tavern interior and they found this building with, depending on who you listen to, either 18th century or early 19th century origins with a, a well-preserved Georgian shop interior. Quick cautionary note um, on the beer. I, I do quite like the beer from St. Peter's Brewery. I believe this is the only pub they um, or they previously owned or supplied to now in London. They're a Suffolk-based brewery. This is their best bitter uh, and um, slightly confusing because the, um, the front of the bar, it's all keg taps. So that's um, you know, that initial lineup at the front of the bar may not be particularly appealing if, like me, you'd rather go to something a bit more sort of real ale leaning. But at the back of the bar, they have the, uh, the, the cask ales. Um, there are only a, perhaps a couple of them on uh, on this particular visit, but um, you know you can find their best bitter there, which is um, you know, it's pretty pleasant, easy drinking, relatively low ABV. Okay, time to call it a day there then. Definitely worth going out of your way to visit this little corner of uh, London on the sort of the edge of the old city of London. It's definitely not on the tourist trail and it has some very interesting historical asides and old buildings nestled in between some I think pretty decent pubs. If I were to select a best pub of the day mm, I think possibly the Hand and Shears. It's, uh, it's an all-time favourite and that sort of really uh, seemed to just have a particular sense of old pub magic to it. I use this miniature digger as the um, backdrop for my outro. Thanks very much for watching, I uh, hope some of that was useful and or enjoyable and I'll see you on the next one.